بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلاما على عباده الذين اصطفى رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي ربنا افتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق وانت خير الفاتحين ثم ما بعد the respected brothers and sisters and also children السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this opportunity to get together in one of the most dear, <coughs> dearest places to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the face of earth, which is the masjid. Ahabu al biqai Allah ta'ala, al masajid. The most beloved places in, on the face of earth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the masajid. So we are so lucky to have this opportunity to be here in the masjid. And alhamdulillah, our intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as we can and to learn something about our deen that will benefit us for sure in our world, worldly life and in the next inshallah. Uh, just I got reminded when I enter the masjid with this lovely story of a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who was quite new to Islam. Then he entered the masjid and then he offered the prayer, Tahiyatul Masjid, and he came to the Prophet and his gathering and he said, Assalamu Alaikum. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, Wa Alaika Assalam, Irja Fasalli, Fa Inna Kalam Tusalli. Go back and repeat your prayer because you haven't prayer. You haven't prayed. The man went back, he repeated his prayer, and then he came back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the gathering, and he said, Assalamu Alaikum. Then he said, Wa Alaikum Assalam. Go back, do your prayer again because you haven't done it properly. The man repeated that a few times. Some of the narration says he done it three times. Some other narration says he done it four times. And then finally he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, this is the best that I could do. That is what I know. What do you mean by repeat your salah, your prayer is not correct? And then he started teaching him how to do his prayer properly. This story looks very simple, but in reality, this story teaches us a lot. First of all, um, the priority is giving to Tahit al-Masjid in case you enter from uh, an entrance which is not close to the people where they are sitting. So the man entered, Rasulullah was there. Before he said, Salamu Assalamu Alaikum, he prayed Tahit al-Masjid and then he came to the Prophet and he said, Assalamu Alaikum. So this is how the, sequ the sequence of events. And Rasulullah replied his salam first, and then he corrected him. So we need to first um, spread the salam and reply to the salam, and then after that we can start, you know, doing the correction if we need to do the correction. You see, thumbs brother, salam alaikum, mafish salam, no salam, no kalam. Oh, you have done another. Salam lillah, you know, giving salam is for the sake of Allah, responding to the salam is an obligation. You see, so you know, that's one thing to learn. And also Rasulullah was very, very soft in the way he taught the people. Don't be harsh on the people. People have very, very fragile hearts. And all what we are working on when it comes to the work of da'wah is on the hearts of the people. To bring the hearts together is a very hard task. It is not, uh, it is not achievable by spending money or uh, like entertaining the people or uh, giving people material promises or something like that. It is way beyond that. It's a very sensitive job. Rasulullah was advised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and before we say that we have to know who was Rasulullah The most gentle person, the most beloved person. He got the best character, the best figure, the best speech, the best words, the best way of communication, the best manners, the best of everything. Yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هو الذي يدك بنصره وبالمؤمنين وألف بين قلوبهم لو أنفقت ما في الأرض جميعا ما ألفت بين قلوبهم ولكن الله ألف بينه. If you were to spend the whole entire wealth that exists on the face of earth, to bring the hearts together, you are not able to do that. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who brought the hearts together. So when you find a gathering of people, when the people 
their hearts are attached to each other, we have to be very, be very appreciative to Allah because we have been given a, a special gift from Allah. You will, you will find a lot of gathering on the face of earth, a lot of gathering, huge number of people, but their hearts are not attached to each other. They're just there because they happen to be there or they have to be there or there is a reason for them to get together, but the hearts are somewhere else. The hearts are somewhere else. Rasulullah pointed out to this fact when he reminded the people before starting the prayer, before starting the prayer, he would remind the people of this fact, of this reality. He would say, Inna Allah la yanzuru ila sawarikum, walakin yanzuru ila kulubikum, allati fi sudurikum, fa'aru Allah min anfusikum, khaira. You guys are standing in a very perfect manner, very perfect mannerism. The Sahaba were standing very straight rose, very quiet, very devoted, very concentrating. But the thing is, Allah doesn't care about that. First the place Allah cares about how they, um, their hearts are attached to the prayer and attached to each other. You see, you might see people standing shoulder by sh shoulder to shoulder in the prayer, but they can't stand each other. They can't get along with each other. The distance between their hearts, the distance between their bodies is just a few inches. But the distance between their hearts are a few miles. Subhanallah. So we got to appreciate this gift of Allah to have the hearts attached to each other and to have such a type of beautiful gathering where we see faces with a beautiful smile, especially the children. I like their smiles. And also when we see the hearts are working together to make something beneficial or to make something productive for the sake of the whole entire community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this effort successful inshallah and enable us and empower us with all the, uh, the equipments to make us inshallah successful community and prosperous community and qualify all of us inshallah to join Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al-firdaus al-a'la. Program, I would like to share with you some thoughts about Surah Al-Mulk. Uh, we will continue inshallah our fiqh classes uh, from next time, inshallah, but today I have something really touched my heart regarding this surah. Uh, this surah should be part of from our daily routine, and uh, to make this routine, uh, to make this a, a daily routine, we need to get some sort of encouragement or inspiration regarding this surah. Surah Al Mulk. Surah Tabarak Al Ladi, Biyadi Al Mulk, Wa Huwa Ala Kulli Shayin Qadir. This surah, subhanAllah, is amazing, and every surah in the Quran has a special flavor and a unique conclusion. Uh, if you read the Quran with your heart, you will come to realize that and have this taste of the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to do the tadabbur with recit reciting the Quran. Not just the recitation, tadabbur. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبُّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَلُهَا He says, why they don't... Uh, ponder over the Qur'an, reflect on the Qur'an. If they can't do that, they might be because they have seals or locks on, upon their hearts. That is why they are not able to uh, reflect on the Qur'an and ponder on the Qur'an. So let's try to approach this surah and find out some of the gems and some of the treasures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept in this beautiful surah. And it may inspire uh, some of us, or maybe all of us, inshallah, to make it a daily task to read this surah before we go to bed, and to make it another task to memorize this surah and teach this surah to our children, inshallah. Probably I may suggest to the Amin community to make a project uh, for the children, inshallah, uh, to memorize the surah or study the surah over the coming year, inshallah, or over the year and give a very beautiful, huge uh, prize for the children who manage to make it to this surah, inshallah. inshallah. And maybe for the brothers and sisters as well. Inshallah. Free rental house for that. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow we'll find everyone here memorizing this surah. <laughs> and the first one. <laughs> surah Al-Mulk is 30 ayah, and this is a Makki surah. And this is the last chunk of the surahs that, was, that were revealed in Mecca. There are different chunks or different bulks of surahs. Together, you find them together, they address one topic. All multiple topics, but they have one conclusion. This conclusion 
that all of these surahs reach is to uh, emphasize the ones of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reject the, the multiple gods and to inculcate into the people in the minds of the people that there is life after death. There is punishment, there is heaven, there is hell, and there is uh, Jannah, there is Nar. So this was actually the message. And this surah is dealing with the same thing. So some people may think it's just like any other surah. What's so special with this surah? The so special with this surah is the approach, the way you approach this surah. The, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approaches this conclusion. You see, when you go to some restaurants, you got served, you, you, you receive, uh, or, or you, you get, uh, or you order a certain type of food, and you pay a lot of money for this food. And you go to a different, another restaurant, you get the same type of food, but you pay less money. Maybe because the way of the service, or the, pay, the way of cooking, that, make different, they, that makes the difference. So similarly, this surah has a very unique texture, a very unique approach, that make it very interesting and very uh, uh, inspiring and make uh, you know reading this surah a kind of pleasure it will bring the pleasure into your heart and into your mind and into your life and you try it and you will never regret inshallah <clears throat> usually the mufassirun when you are when you read in the books of tafsir you see before every surah a group of hadith to encourage the people to read the surah or to study particular surah Unfortunately, most of these hadith are weak or fabricated. Uh, when it comes to Surah Al-Mulk, there are certain narrations that are authentic, but not all of these narrations are authentic. So I will just uh, share with you some of these narrations just as appetizer to help us, inshallah, be motivated and inspired to study this Surah. And I believe the young people here, inshallah, will be the first people to ask their parents or to ask their teachers to learn this Surah, Surah Al-Mulk. You see, for example, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, this hadith is narrated by Imam Tirmidhi and an authentic chain of narrators. إِنِّي لَا عَرِفُ سُورَةً فِي الْقُرْآنِ ثَلَاثُونَ آيَةٍ مَا هِيَ إِلَّا ثَلَاثُونَ آيَةٍ حَاجَّتْ عَنْ صَاحِبِهَا حَتَّى أَدْخَلَتْهُ الْجَنَّةِ It's so beautiful. He said, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so talked to the people saying, I know of a surah which is just 30 ayah. It kept arguing in front of Allah about somebody who deserved to go to the hellfire until he was forgiven and he was granted the Jannah. SubhanAllah. See, Rasulullah started the conversation that way. I know of a surah, it's just like giving the people a puzzle or a riddle that is something great. I know of something, guys, very surprisingly, this surah stood in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to argue about somebody who deserves to be punished and end of the conversation, on the end of the argument, this man was forgiven and he was granted the Jannah. Rasulullah also says, Inna suratan min al-Quran hajat an sahibiha hatta adkharatu al-Jannah. That's another way of saying the same thing, the same, reaching the same conclusion, but look at the, these words of Rasulullah sallallahu He said, there is a surah in the Quran that not just argue, make a case, and continue con con consistently making this case in front of Allah, not letting it go at all. Because sometimes the lawyer, give up when the case is very complicated or hopeless case and say, okay, you know, judge, yes, this is my, uh, my client, but end of the day, I want him to go to capital punishment because it's just a hopeless case. So in this case, Allah Rasulullah said, this surah is going to argue and keep argue. This guy looks like hopeless, but this surah will keep argue until this person will be definitely forgiven, subhanAllah. It's confirming the same conclusion that because of this surah, uh, that, it, that that person will be forgiven and will be granted the Jannah. But the beautiful thing in this narration, the Rasulullah said, Hajjat an sahibiha, the companion of this surah. So he is not just a reader or a reciter, but he is a companion of this surah. That he is, so attached, he is attached to this surah so much so that they become companions, they become mates and buddies and friends. So he has this surah between his skin and flesh. He, he, this surah is uh, dwelling is living in his heart, not just reading it, which another step forward on the top of reading and studying, we need to make the surah like sort of part of our life. Uh, medicine, uh, medicine that we take every day to heal our heart and our minds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heal our hearts and our minds and our bodies Amen. and make us successful inshallah in this life and the life to come. Amen. Also Rasulullah confirmed in one narration that this surah uh, will save the its, com its companion from the punishment in the grave. 
سورة 30 آية تقي صاحبها أو قارئها من عذاب القبر. It will save the read the one who read the surah, recite the surah from عذاب القبر. Also narrated from the wives of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم that used to recite two surahs before he goes to bed. سورة ألف لام ميم تنزيل السجدة and سورة تبارك الذي بيده الملك. So this was a routine of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Did a routine before he goes to sleep. Alongside with many other adhkar, he would recite those two surahs. So, inshallah, we will give a promise. Inshallah, from now on, try to uh, read this surah before we go to bed. And from now, inshallah, we start reciting this surah and learning about it, inshallah. Surah Al-Mulk, as I said, is a Makki surah. And the general topic of the Makki surah is giving the people a reminder of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the divinity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messengerhood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the messenger of Allah, the seal of the Prophet. And also reminding the people that after this life, there is another life to come. And in this next life, people will go to either hell or heaven. So the people have to be prepared for that. And the surah starts with this way. There is only two surahs in the Quran begin with this word. Tabaraka, the word Tabarak. Surah Al-Furqan and Surah Al-Mulk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start of the surah saying Tabarak al-ladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadeer This is the first time Shadow translation is Blessed is the one in whose hand is all the kingdom and he has power over everything But the word Tabarak is such an amazing word It will actually fire us up to learn more about this beautiful Quran and the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Tabarak comes from the word Barakah and this word is very common and well known to all the people, all Muslims, even um, you know, the non-Arabs still know this word Barakah. But originally this word is derived from the word Barakah al bair When the Ba'ir, the camel, sit down, then it means that he's just, he's sit down, will sit it, you can't get him to get up until he wants to get up. So it is, it is, more, it, it is about settling, Somebody, something is moving and then sit it. And also comes from the word barakah. And if you put those two meanings together, you will understand what does tabarak mean. Barakah is to increase the blessings of something, which unexpectedly. There is something that you expect to reap from it something or to get the out, certain outcome from it. And then you get more than what you expect. This is barakah. Right? This is barakah. So, for example, you go to... You have food, you cook food enough for five people, for example, just enough for five people, and you serve with the food, the five people eat to their full, and then after they finish, you find the food, the food is almost there, still there, or maybe most of the food is still there. What that it is? Baraka. You expect to do certain things in one hour, and in this one hour you do a lot, what you are planning to do, you finish all of them out, and you find yourself you still you still have another half an hour. So what happened? How how did I finish that much work in this short time? Because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala put baraka on this time. So this is the baraka, right? The meaning of baraka is you get more than what you expect, and you get more than what even expected, like scientifically expected, uh, logically expected. You will get more than that. Subhanallah. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted to say. Is Allah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our imagination, beyond our expectation. So whatever whatever we think about Allah, Allah is greater than that. Allah is better than that. So we're not allowed to try to imagine Allah or to estimate the power of Allah or to measure the qudra, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the authority of Allah, because Allah is all beyond that. Way beyond what we may expect or way beyond what we may uh, imagine. And also when we expect from Allah we should open our imagination to the top, to the maximum, to infinity. Because we're, the way we, we expect uh, from people is limited, or our expectations uh, are limited to our own imagination. Like, if you ask anyone, what, what, what are your dreams today? He would give you the dreams according to his expectation. I dream to have a car, I dream to have a palace, I dream to have this and that. Or, you know, people have different dreams. And their dreams are limited to their expectation or uh, um, uh, imagination. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even beyond that. So when you ask everyone, whosoever, what do you 
to see in the Jannah. If you go back 1400 years ago and ask the people, what do you expect there in the Jannah? 1400 years ago, the people say, ah, we will have nice camels, beautiful horses, special tents, you see, and beautiful oil lamps there. Because they think this is the maximum. This is the maximum luxury they can have. Today, people will talk about palaces, talk about limousine, talk about like aeroplanes, starships and stuff like that. Maybe in 50 years of time, people will have different wishes and different things. I remember one of the children in Kilburn was asking me after some talk, do you mean that everything I wish, I will see it in the Jannah? I said, yes, inshallah. I said, ah, so I will find there like um, uh, Angry Birds there. I can play Angry Birds there. <laughs> Uh, yes, we can start Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> so this is. <laughs> we can ask the young people. What do you expect uh, to see in the Jannah? <laughs> so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted to pass on this message. It's not what you expect. Allah is Tabarak. It's way beyond what you expect, right? When Rasulullah was asked about the Jannah, he actually closed the door for for the people to limit the Jannah to their imagination. He said, فِيهَا مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرْ So beautiful. There in the Jannah, you will see things that never ever ever been seen by any eye, any other eye, never been heard of, never come to the imagination or at, you know, approach the heart of anyone. So it's way beyond what we may ever uh, suggest or expect or anticipate, subhanAllah. And also, this barakah, this increase that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us, is not temporary. It is stable. Same like the ba'ir, the camel, when it, you know, sit down, it doesn't move. It's already sitting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the two meanings together. The barak, the barakah is there and it is stable. So what you get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sustainable. It is consistent. It is not temporary. Whatever we get in our life, it is limited to the 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 sorcerer, to the the, the 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 you know the source that we get from it. Like if you if you get money from a company, it's limited to this company, uh, you know, capacity or ability to exist and survive in the market. But one day it will collapse. One day this money will be bank. This company will be bankrupt. And the people will be fired. Or something will happen, this company will have something up and down. But when you get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is stable, it is sustainable, it is consistent, it is forever. Subhanallah. Alladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. The one in whose hand all the kingdom. Alladhi biyadihi al-mulku. Subhanallah. The Quran is designed in such a way that actually take our heart, take over our hearts and our minds. If we if we want to put this sentence in the uh, in the in the Arabic sequence of of of, uh, of words, like what it grammat grat uh, grammatically in the uh, average sequence of the sentence, we would say Tabaraka Allahu al al mulku biyadi. This is how it should go. Should go. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't make mention of His name because. He doesn't want to mention his name. He wanted the people to think about who is this guy, who is this God, who is this person, who is this being, who has all of that, who can give us give increase of everything, and at the same time who has sustainable and stable kingdom. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about kingdom, talk about authority, and the listeners, the audience, would think about all the kings of their time. And they will come to the conclusion that all of those kings of their time, they have limited sources and limited time and limited capacity. Yes, they might have authority and kingdom, but this kingdom is limited to how much power they have, how much army they have. Because if one, as long as they are packed or backed by an army, this is how much authority they have. Once the army is not there, they worth nothing. And of course, it's very obvious now you see a president or a ruler backed by an army. Once the army give, you know, show the back to this ruler, this ruler is just finished. His authority is extracted or, uh, you know, um, uh, is obtained from his army, the people who support him. And if it doesn't happen, 
his kingdom will come to an end by his death. That's finished. He's a ruler, he's a good authority. But once he passed away, he dies, then his authority will come to an end. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to introduce himself to the audience, the people of Mecca, but in such a way to let them think of any other king and come to the conclusion the only one who got all of that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose kingdom is not, is not limited to anything, his authority is not limited to anything, but his authority is indefinite and his authority is stable and he, he has the power to give increase all the time, subhanahu wa ta'ala. بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ That the mulk in his hand. When you come to this uh, word in the Quran, بِيَدِهِ His hands. Uh, the question arise, arises actually. What does Allah mean by his hands? Uh, actually, these type of words resulted in a lot of confusion among the people who want to go out of their way or try to uh, uh, explain every single word in the Quran according to their own understanding. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, doesn't want us to try to uh, like explain everything according to the, our own understanding. He wants us to leave things to the, our principal belief in the unseen, in the messengerhood of Rasulullah sallallahu He is the honest person. He delivered the message completely without any decrease. And he has given us these words and we have to take these words and believe in them according to the way Rasulullah explained. So what we believe as Muslims and according to the companions of Rasulullah believe and Rasulullah's teaching that Allah is as is he described himself but he is not similar to his creation. He is not similar to his creation and he is not under our imagination. In other words, Allah said in his hand. Does it mean that he got a hand like my hand with five fingers, with knuckles and neck? No. Does it mean just power? This is a metaphorical word. Allah knows best. But I just believe like that. What Allah described himself is as is. I just take it like that and I say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about himself more than anyone else. I don't have to give a meaning for this word because Rasulullah didn't say the word biyadi here, his hand means authority. It doesn't literally mean yadi. Allah said yet. So Allah is as he said about himself. It's not my business, it's not my, my job to uh, uh, try to explain or to understand what does this hand mean. Leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take it as, as it is. As it is. Allah talk about the angels. Somebody try to explain to us how the angel look like? Do they have wings? And how, how big is their wings? And how they look like? Can I take a picture of them? And say, it's Allah told us there are, the, there are angels. These are the creation of Allah. Just take it like that. They are created the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to create them. And they are Allah, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. Whatever information give it to the, give us, uh, given to us, we just take this information and say, Amanna billah. This is what Allah said and that, that's it. We believe in that. We don't have any doubt about it. We don't have any uh, suspension, suspicion, or we don't have any issue about uh, believing in what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said and the way He described His creatures. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Biyadi al mulk, the the kingdom, the authority, all in His hand." And the word al mulk, the alif and lam in the Lugal Arabiya, they call it lam al istigraq, lam al istigraq that. It encompasses all type of authority. So the real kingdom, the real authority is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no one, no, uh, no one has any kind of authority. In reality, no one has any authority over anything at all. No one has any kingdom at all. It's all fake. As I said, their authority is based on the, uh, on the support they get from their armies. Otherwise, they have nothing, subhanAllah. That is why when, Rasul, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about Fir'aun, Pharaoh, and how he was mistaken, and how he was misleading the people, he didn't just include him only, because he himself as a person worth nothing. But he said he, his minister, his government, and his army, all wrong. In the Fir'auna, wa Hamana, wa Junudahuma, kanu khatayin. Indeed, Fir'aun and Haman, he's the prime minister, or the main minister, and the principal minister, that is a government, representative of the government, and what you know, the army all wrong, all mistaken. Because Pharaoh as a person has no authority. He got all of his authority from 
the people around him. And this is a case with anyone who claims any type of authority. And he has power over everything. Now this word is very tricky actually. He has power over everything. There is a difference between Qudra and Istata'a. Power and capability. Why? Because, you know, um, some people say Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, He can do everything. Allah can do everything. Then some funny person will ask a question, can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, become a woman? Uh, can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lie? Can he lie? Can he cheat? Can he eat? Can he have a son? If you say no, okay, but you said he can do everything. How come he can't do that? I mean, you got, to, you got stuck. You see? Uh, but Allah said, uh, He said, He has, He is able to, He can't do anything. Ah, oh, that's a wrong translation. Because of the wrong translation, then we come to wrong conclusion and wrong question. Allah has power over everything, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to control everything. But to do everything, He can do everything. That is, this statement is not correct. Allah does whatever He wants to do. Allah does what He wants to do. It is not me to suggest, can Allah do that? This question in the first place is wrong. This question is very wrong. It is just like asking about the cold the fire, uh, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, cold fire or frozen air or something that, you know, can't put them together. So, saying Allah, can Allah do this or can Allah, that's a wrong question. All what we believe in, that Allah has power over everything, Allah has control over everything, and He does what He wants to do. To do. Because here, Qudra means Allah has the power over everything. And also the word Qadir, you know, it, it means Qudra, power or authority, or Allah has the control everything, also has another meaning or, uh, beside the word Qudra, which is limitation. Qudra comes from the word Qadr, which means limitation. Allah has put limits to everything. Which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put limitation for everything. So you can translate this word like that. Allah, that Allah has put limitation to everything. So everything is limited. Nothing is unlimited except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah's power is unlimited. Allah's authority is unlimited. Allah's life is unlimited. Allah's authority is unlimited, but everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is limited. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set a limit to everything. So yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, you know, has given us some blessings and has given us some bounties and knowledge, but Allah lim put limit for everything. Why? Because we are, we are not in a position to know everything or to get everything what we want. This is only in the Jannah. When everything you want or everything you wish for, you can get it. But here in this dunya, you are limited. You want to see things, Allah said, you are limited. Your vision is limited to see what I want you to see. Your capacity of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, life or your, your physical power is limited to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you in this limit. I mean, people wish to fly, you know, swing there their, uh, their uh, hands and fly. But our body is not designed. Allah limits our body to do that. We can use other things to fly, but our body is not designed to fly. Our body is not designed to run forever. Our body is not designed to revive, survive without food and water. We are limited to certain things, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has put these limits to everything. Tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir الذي خلق الموت والحياة. How much time I still have? Another ten minutes or so. So الذي خلق. There is only one place in the Quran, one place in the Quran that Allah said خلق الموت. There is no any other place in the Quran Allah said Allah has created death. Allah said in the Quran أمات وأحيا. He gives life and he causes death. But this is the only time in the Quran Allah سبحانه وتعالى says خلق الموت. Because Allah wanted to say that death is creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not the end of life, it is not the absence of life, it is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means that is a stage of our existence. It's a phase of our existence. 
It is not the absence of life, it is another stage that we have to go through. You know, the people who don't have faith in the life after death, what they think about death, death is the end of life, it's the end of a story, absence of life. But what we should believe, is this is the creation of Allah, that we have to go through this creation. Where our connection with this world will be shifted to a different phase, a different stage. So it's a different, a different type of existence. But it is not absent of existence. So our body is connected to this world. When we die, it doesn't mean that we, خلاص, we just close the file and we are not existing anymore. No, we just come to exist in a different place, in a different ex shape, in a different form. And we carry on until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us to a different stage. So that is why Allah said here, الذي خلق الموت والحياة. He is the one who has created death, and he has created also life. Now, why life come death before life? Most of the mufassirun come to this conclusion said because we we used to be dead before we come to this life. And he said in the Quran also in Surah Al-Baqarah, كيف تكفرون بالله وكنتم أمواتا فحياكم. How come do you believe in? How come you disbelieve in Allah? And you were dead, and Allah has given you life. But one of the scholars, one of the Mufassirin has given an explanation which is really very interesting. He said, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةِ الْمَوْتِ means this world is the life, this dunya, and الْحَيَاةِ is the next life. Why? Because death is a process of decay. It's a process of a decay. Which means that it's a process that starts and comes to an end. That's a process when your body is not functioning anymore. When this happens, from the day we are, we are born, then our body starts, you know, demeriting or devaluating or decaying. And then until they come to a stage that this body is not functioning anymore. Which means that we are actually experiencing death every single day. Because if we take this from time point of view, then we are, we are bound by the time. Every day goes, we are, you know, processing that. The, pro the, the death process is, 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 is going on, right? So, it's just like in you know, one step of the process is taking place. And also we experience this every single day. When we go to sleep, that is a time of death. So we experience death every single day. The evidence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Rasulullah innaka mayyitun wa innahum mayyitun. That can be translated as you are going to die and they are going to die. But another translation, which is literal translation, which also applicable to this ayah, he said, you are already dead, and they are already dead. Which means you have started the process of death, and you will carry on, and once this process is complete, your body will stop functioning, and then you are not in this world anymore, you are in a different world, subhanAllah. So in reality, we are, we are actually experiencing the process of death from day one, and everyone is limited to some time boundary some people will be taking the process will take them 60 years some people this process will take them 70 years 100 years but eventually this process will come to a completion so we are actually going through the process of death from day one we come to this earth the real life when there is no decay when there is no death processing is the life after this in the jannah because the people are not gonna get old they will not get sick they will not go hungry they will not have the symptoms of death, the symptoms of, you know, decrease in their body function and their, uh, uh, you know, mechanism. So they are not decreasing. They are actually stable. They are in a stable uh, sort of life. So this is actually real life. But currently we are in a process of death. Rasulullah <laughs> uh, says, al mawtu aqrabu ila ahadikum min shurakina alihi uh, that the death is very close to you just like the uh, laces, laces of your shoes which means that you, the process can come to an end at any time that is why you see some people very healthy and very fit and all of a the sudden they die why? because the process of death this is the end of their process they have already started the process of death and that is why they come to an end of their process their body is not there anymore can't function anymore so they go or they move to the next stage that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَا This is the right sequence of the right order of events that we are in the process of death and 
Then after that, we will experience the real life. He said also in Surah Al-Rum, وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانُ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ الحيوان is a, a dual word of the word حياة. حياة تاني. And instead of saying حياة تاني, he said حيواني and then حياة الحياة حيواني which means that the two حياة, the two lives that are not here. If you are going to live two lives and you think this is the first life and the one that comes out later is the second life, you are mistaken. The two lives are actually after death. But this time you spend here on, earth, on the earth, you are actually processing the death. But you are here to present something and to do st some, some kind of job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, classified to us. Uh, but in reality, you are actually not alive because of this limitation. The life inspired us with unlimited resources or unlimited, uh, you know, increase on un unlimited sort of life. But here, we are limited in everything. Limited in everything. So you can't actually uh, consider the time we spend here in this earth as real life, but we just consider is a mission or a task or an experience that we have to go through, and then the real life will be after we move from this world to the next one, inshallah. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عمل to test you who is going to uh, manifest or to make the best use of his life to have the best of deeds and the best of actions وهو العزيز الغفور سبحانه وتعالى I will finish with that but I would like to remind myself and all of you that this is a very beautiful surah and it's a very inspiring surah, inshallah. We will try to go through it, inshallah, for the next sessions, inshallah. And also would like to remind everyone that this surah uh, is uh, protection from punishment in the grave and also protection from the hellfire. And also this is a very inspiring surah for the people who are interested to study the Quran. Let's try to read it every single night or at least, you know, for whenever we are uh, available for that, inshallah. And let's make a task in our life to memorize it somehow or part of it and read it with our children inshallah and make it a kind of uh, daily task and uh, uh, home homework that we do together family together inshallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, enlighten our heart and our minds with the light of the quran and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this gathering to send his blessings and his mercy to all of us and our families and our beloved one and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and to uh, grant us success in this life and the life to come and forgive our parents our dad and moms and to forgive our scholars and to forgive those people who benefited us in this world and to grant guidance to all the people here in New Zealand and all the people all over the world, inshallah. Amen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our Muslim brothers and sisters everywhere in the world from the persecution and from the tortures of the tyrants and dictators. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver them safely from their dilemma and bring them back again, again to the fold of Islam. Allahumma. Jazakumullah khairan for your time and your attention. Assalamu alaikum.